Let's go and uh, open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll begin. Lord Jesus, we come before you, and we acknowledge that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. We acknowledge that you know all things, that you understand uh, man's hearts, and that you see through our, uh, through our charades. And Lord, we just pray that as we go through this presentation this afternoon, that you would help us to be able to see past the charades that are taking place in the interfaith world, and that in turn, we would look to you and to you only as our source of salvation, as our source of redemption. We ask that you give us clarity of thought, clarity of mind, clarity of speech, and uh, that we can walk away from here as ambassadors for you. We pray this in your name. Amen. The talk I'm going, give, I'm going to be giving to you today is on the interfaith movement. And I want you to think of the interfaith movement both in terms of its religious importance, but also its political influence. And I'm going to be talking to you about some major events, and particularly one aspect of the interfaith movement, and that is the, par the Parliament of the World's Religions. Now, while it's easy to take a look at the big picture issues, the big picture scenarios, I would also want you to keep in mind that what we're talking about filters down to the local level. And indeed, one of the things that I've experienced as I've gone to interfaith events is that the discussions, the movements, the influences comes down to the local level. What we're talking about are not abstract ideas, but reality. So I've got a couple of themes that I am repeating in each of my talks. One of them is to ask the question, why do a presentation like this? Why do a study like this? Indeed, why have a conference like this? A few things, a few very important things. Number one, first off, so that you're not uninformed as to the direction of our society. You need to see past the hype, the rumors, the misinformation, the sensationalistic, and be able to dig into what is real and what is important. To connect the dots in your own life experience. And this is kind of interesting because as I go through the interfaith movement, its history, a little bit of its history, and some of its influence, I'm sure some of you will be going, ah, I have seen my own church or my community engage in activities that have some parallels, some similarities. I come from a Mennonite, evangelical Mennonite background. I'm just going to say this up front. I have watched the Mennonite community absolutely get suckered in to the interfaith movement to the point where I can talk to Mennonites and the question will come up of Islam and there'll be Mennonites who say, oh, it's the same God. They worship the same God. No. No. And so there is, there is definitely a relevance to trying to understand the interfaith movement because it is, it is completely filtering into the culture, the Christian culture around us. To be warned, so we don't become gullible participants because we do. Don't kid yourselves. The Christian community absolutely becomes a gullible participant in what we see happening within the broader culture. It used to be at one time, we led the culture. We led civilization. We led the, we had the ethics, the morality. There was a, a, a moray that we had and held. That's not the case anymore. Now we follow the culture. We follow behind what society tells us to do and say and think and believe. It's important that we understand this so we know how the Christian message is being challenged, because it is. There is no question. To recognize how it is preaching itself into our own culture so we can see past the packaging, past all the hype, and understand the worldview being presented. Also that we're strengthened within our own faith. By understanding some of this, we have to also then wrestle with our own faith. What do we believe? What do you believe? What do you stand on? Where is our firm foundation found? And we have to do this with the understanding that we have a culture that is hostile to the biblical message. And finally, and this is really important, I mean, I can't stress this enough. I stressed this in the beginning, yesterday's first talk. I will stress this again tonight so that you are an effective ambassador for Christ. And as I said yesterday morning, I gave a bit of a breakdown of what an ambassador means, 
because it's not something we typically can grasp unless you really think about it. Just a little clue, a little hint for those who might not have been here yesterday. To be an ambassador means you are literally, literally the legal and official representative of your king in a foreign land. That is what you are. That is an extremely high calling. I can't think of anything more important in terms of our calling than the fact that we are ambassadors, truly legal and official representatives. Which means when you interact with the world around you, you are a diplomat for your king. And then that should flavor how you express yourself, how you present yourself, how you communicate. So in understanding the interfaith movement, I'm hoping it will help us to become better ambassadors as we see, even with our own churches, a, uh, a, a move towards some of the things I'll be talking about this afternoon. I also want to reemphasize this point that there are two ways of looking at ultimate reality. And my friend Dr. Peter Jones breaks this down as oneism or twoism. In my book, Game of Gods, I break it down as oneness versus otherness. The bottom line is this. In oneness, everything ultimately shares the same essence. God, man, and nature are all essentially the same. I'm repeating this, but this is so important. I'm going to repeat this on every one of my talks so that you get it. Ultimately, Reality, in this sense, is God, man, and nature sharing the same essence. This is the heartbeat of Eastern mysticism. This is the heartbeat of paganism. This is even the heartbeat of our secular atheistic thinking, which says man is the measure of all things. It's oneness or reality is two. God, separate, distinct, categorically different, outside of time, space, and matter. It is God and then everything else. God and then creation. And we see what happens in Romans 1 when we serve creation and battle our need to create what is created, not the creator. That is a oneness or one-ism perspective. So you have this option. Reality, how you look at reality, breaks down into these two functions. Are you either a oneist or a twoist? Not a dualist. There's a difference. And how you then look at religion and politics and culture technology, all of this will be flavored in some sense of how you perceive ultimate reality. So Genesis 1 demonstrates that indeed reality is two. God distinct and different. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God structures time. In the beginning, this God, outside of time, space, and matter, begins the act of creation. And we see in Genesis 1 a a division, judgments, standards, binaries, separating points all throughout. Light and darkness, land, sea, and heavens, distinctions within species. Humanity is distinct from the animal kingdom. We are different. There is a categorical difference. There's even distinctions in genders. And as I said earlier yesterday, if you want to understand the gender sexual revolution as to what it really is and what is pumping it forward, it is truly grounded in the sense of oneness. Things blur. Gender identity blurs. It all uh, morphs together in some way, shape, or form. You can change. There are no distinctions, ultimate distinctions. Turn in your Bible to Isaiah 45. As we look through and think through interfaithism, I want us to keep in mind the God who we serve, who is distinct, who is other. Isaiah 45, 15 to 22. Think about this within the interfaith message which, sa which says all religions are ultimately true. A truth claim is found throughout each. There is a perennial philosophy. Isaiah 45, 15 going to 22. Truly, you are God who hide yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. They shall be ashamed and also disgraced, all of them. They shall go in confusion together, who are makers of idols. But Israel shall be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed or disgraced forever and ever. For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who established it? 
who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, you who have escaped from the nations. They have no knowledge, who carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God that cannot save. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who, is the, who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God beside me. A just God and a Savior, there is none besides me. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. I would say that's pretty categorically uh, firm. Uh, it is definitely exclusive. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. What is, what, what, let's break this down a little bit. In verse 15, we see the acknowledgement of God's salvation, that this is found in him. And those who trust in idols, as we see in verse 16, will be put to shame. Verse 17 reminds us that Israel's salvation is everlasting. Why? Why is it everlasting? Verse 18 gives us that clue as to why, because the God of Israel is the creator of all things. He is literally the author of life. And as the author of life, the creator of all things, when you place your salvation in him, he is indeed the one who saves. This is why salvation for Israel is everlasting. Verse 19, God can be known. He can be sought. It's not something, he is not something that's, that, that hides himself from you. You can know him. He can be sought. Verse 20 reminds us, false gods can't save. There's no knowledge in them. There is no knowledge in the false, in false gods. Verse 21 asks the question, rhetorically speaking, do you think false gods and idols can save? Really? Do you think so? Then bring forward your case. Compare the knowledge of those false gods against what I have said as the true Lord, as the true God. Compare because I am the one who has said all these things and put them in motion. And then verse 22, look to the Lord for salvation because there is no one else who can save, period. Categorical, end of story. God is it. Turn over to John 1, and we'll read verses 1 to verse 18. It's a passage that many of you are very familiar with. John 1, verses 1 to 18. And here we see the Word made flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear light, pardon me, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace, for the law was given through Moses, 
but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So what's going on? The declaration of Jesus Christ as the living word, as God manifest in flesh, Savior and Redeemer. He is in the beginning as God. He is God. All things are created through him. He is, again, the author of life, literally the author of life. And you know, I'm going to go on a quick rabbit trail here. When I was younger, it really bothered me. Why? Why death? Why was death the consequence of the fall? I mean, of all the things, why something so harsh, so final, so personally cataclysmic? Why death? Well, he is the author of life. And logically speaking, what happens when we turn our back from the author of life and head off in our own way, charting our own course, saying, I am master of my own meaning and destiny? If we turn our back on the author of life, logically speaking, we have walked the path of death. I can't blame God for that. That's our doing. When we turn away from God, we walk the path of death. Christ is a light that shines in the darkness. John is a witness to that light. John is an ambassador to that light, as you are also ambassadors to the light of Christ. John is a very special, particular witness to that light. Recognizing that Jesus is the one who made the world, but the world rejected him. He is the redeemer of Israel, but Israel didn't receive him. Yet those who receive and believe in him are the children of God. Verse 14 reinforces the word became flesh, Jesus Christ. And then verse 15 is, remember, John was that witness. Here's a witness to this. Real. Verse 16 to 18, God's grace is now before us. Grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ, God made flesh. I'm reminding you all of this because when we look at the interfaith movement, we need to understand firmly where we place our faith. Firmly, who is true. Firmly, who is the author of life. Who created all things. John 14, 6 and 7, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. What's interesting with, as you in, engage in interfaith thinking, is that and my friend Don Vano has brought this forward. He says, every path leads to God. And he does it tongue-in-cheek. He's a Christian. And this is what you hear over and over again in the interfaith movement. All paths lead to God. Yes, all men will eventually bow their knee to the one who made us. Every, every man, every woman, every person will eventually bow their knee. In this respect, every path leads to God and to judgment and to judgment. The God that we serve is inclusive in that he wants all to come to him, but he is exclusive in that he wants it his way because he is the author of life, and you and I are not. One ism is found in the Bible, and I want us to remember this because as we look at the interfaith movement, we'll see it's oneist in its nature. Oneism is found in the Bible, this idea that man, nature, and deity share the same essence. Romans 1.25, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. This is the divinity of nature. This is the oneness of man and nature and the divine. And then Genesis 3.5, the first lie, the first deception that you can be as God is the creation saying we can be the same we can share that same essence. It is a form of oneness, the very first form of oneness. And so if oneness is the dominant worldview, and I argue in my book, Game of Gods, that indeed it is the dominant worldview, then it's going to impact how you look at a multitude of things, including culture, economics, values, your ethics, sexuality, and tonight, today we're going to look at religion in particular. So I'm going to take you to one event to demonstrate that there is a political side to the interfaith movement as much as there is a religious component. 
and then we're going to jump into the Parliament experience. I know I shared this with uh, this conference a number of years ago, but it bears repeating. In 2010, I had the opportunity of attending the G8 World Religions Summit in Winnipeg. Everybody is aware of the G8 political summits. Heads of state come together. They fly to wherever it's held that year, and the leaders of the G8 nations uh, convene and have meetings. At the same time, what is less well known is that the religious community does the same thing. And in 2010, I was able to attend the parallel, the religious parallel of the G8 summit. And it took place in Winnipeg. And there we were told that there's not only one way, that there are many ways to God. And that we could all serve the God we know by so many different names. So these are some of the religions that were represented. The Baha'i community, that's understood. The Baha'i within their own prophecies claim that we are moving to a one world one faith, one economic, one political system, and they are working to achieve that. That is why when you go to the United Nations, you interact a lot with the Baha'i international community. They are at a lot of the UN summits and UN events because they truly believe that we are moving towards the fulfillment of that prophecy. There was the indigenous and the pagan community, representatives from Judaism, the Hindu fe Federation, uh, the Sikh community was there, the Ministry of Islamic Affairs from Saudi Arabia attended. Yes, the Islamic community is very involved within the interfaith movement, and you're going to see that in the next little while, too. For myself, what was the most disturbing was Christian representation, because we were overrepresented. We definitely carried the show in terms of we being Christians. And so we were all sitting around the table, holding hands with the world, playing kumbaya. Ultimately, are there any distinctions or differences? Well, you know, what distinctions and differences we have, we kept that silent. Specifically, specifically Jesus Christ, because that brings conflict. And the interfaith movement is not about conflict. It is about finding peace through unity. And peace through unity is the goal. So what did we talk about? We talked about religion and politics. We coexisted. We talked about the necessity of religious unity for the common good, for world peace. We talked a lot about developing a global financial infrastructure. We engaged in economics. We talked about the need for a new economic social order. And I remember the representative from the uh, Salvation Army talking to us about how it's not about having a bike for each person, using a metaphor for what the new economic structure should look like. It's about learning to share one bike in community. Really? Really? I've, I've seen this before. I, I recognize where this comes from. Hmm. There was a gentleman by the name of Karl Marx who had that idea. Welcome to socialism with a nice friendly veneer of religiosity thrown on top of it. A lot of discussion, and I mean a lot of discussion, about the necessity of engaging in eco-justice and having a gospel of respecting nature. It was said, and I've got a couple of quotes here, and this is taken from my own, my own uh, uh, audio recordings and notes from the event, that we are the biggest parasites on earth, that we need to develop earth loyalties and form a spiritually generated global ethic. That's really the heartbeat of what we were doing at that event. And then in all of this, there needed to be some management structure, some management institution to help guide us, to help move us along, because otherwise it's just willy-nilly, right? We need some form of infrastructure, social, economic, political infrastructure, and that has to be the United Nations or something similar to the UN. So where did the... Oh, oh thank you. So where did the modern interfaith movement begin? Where do we see the start of it? Oh, there's still feedback. Oh, well. Is that what that was? Yeah? OK. All right. So where did the modern interfaith movement have its, its beginning? What's the root of it? You can look back to the 1893 Parliament of World Religions, which was a part of the Columbia Exposition in Chicago. And it was our first attempt looking at other religions of the world and saying, we can all work together. This is one of the statements that was made. 
The religion of the future will be universal in every sense. It will embody all the thoughts and aspirations and virtues and emotions of all humanity. It will draw together all lands and peoples and kindreds and tongues into a universal brotherhood of love and service. It will establish upon earth a heavenly order. The 1893 Parliament was a tipping point. It was a change. It was where the Christian community and world religions could come together and say, we can look forward to the next century and see a century of peace, unbridled peace and prosperity, a time where we can come together in unity, political unity, religious unity, and come together as one. Well, of course, we know the opposite happened. The 20th century was the bloodiest, most destructive century in human history. Another tipping point that happened at the 1893 Parliament was the introduction of the East coming West. Swami Vivekananda, whose name is still uh, venerated for his introduction of Eastern Hindu concepts into the West, was introduced at the Parliament of World Religions. In fact, so venerated is Swami Vivekananda and his involvement in helping the West to accept Eastern ideas the, the 2015 Parliament of World Religions and the 2018 Parliament, his name came up over and over and over again. If you go through the history of this event, 1893, it's interesting. Apparently, all that Swami Vivekananda had to do was walk across the stage and people would erupt in applause. People came from all over to hear the Swami because he addressed everybody as brothers and sisters. It didn't matter what you believe. Very interesting. Oh, side note, uh, David Rockefeller, apparently, as the, the story goes, and I found this when I was doing the research for my, for my book, David Rockefeller at one point visited Swami Vivekananda, wanted to, to find out a little bit more about this man from India, and ended up having a, a discussion, just a short discussion, about uh, how rich Mr. Rockefeller was. And Swami Vivekananda more or less challenged him on his use of money. David Rockefeller came and threw a bunch of money later on at him and said, here, here you go. And Swami Vivekananda basically pushed it back in his hands and said, no, no, this is not for me. You need to give this out. And the way the story goes, that was the beginning of David Rockefeller's ideas of philanthropy and developing the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and the Rockefeller Trust and the, uh, the use of philanthropic money uh, to, to be engage in social change. Hmm. A lot of things happened because of the 1893 Parliament of the World Religions. But this is your starting point. 100 years later, the 1993 Parliament takes place in Chicago with 8,000 attendees. At that event, they discussed and bring forward the idea of a global ethic. We need to find some guiding principle we can all agree upon. The next parliament took place in 18, pardon me, 1999 in Cape Town with 7,000 people attending, then Barcelona, then Melbourne, and then Salt Lake City. That was the one I attended with 15,000, pardon me, 10,000 participants. And then Toronto, only a few months ago, with 7,500 people attending. I'm going to take you on a bit of a road trip, literally giving you a slideshow, some, some photos. Uh, Kind of like the, the way a family would show their, their trips, you know, the, the pictures from their trips. So that you see what it's like at the Parliament. So I'm going to first of all take you to the Salt Lake City Parliament in 2015, where approximately 50 different religious and spiritual paths were represented by over 10,000 religious leaders and social activists. So here's a few pictures of just the opening. Uh, we had shamans, Native American shamans coming in. They were the ones who opened the parliament, blessed the parliament. And the bottom picture is just simply the crowds as they're gathering together. A lot of energy in the room. It's a place of excitement. There is heady, heady anticipation about what we would be achieving over the course of that week. A few different pictures from some of the other aspects of the parliament. On the top is a world water ceremony, and there you have Jains, Sikhs, Muslims, Jews, Christians, a long list. In fact, there was a long line of people all around past how the picture goes as they engage in a world water ceremony. The uh, whirling dervishes 
Um, that was a sight to see. Has anybody ever seen Sufi whirling dervishes in real life? Do you even know what that is? Some do, some don't. Sufism is the mystical branch of Islam. It is a, a very experiential element within Islam. And Sufism has this idea of a universal God, a universal uh, consciousness. That, that comes out with some Sufi teachings. And they have dancers. So the music is playing, and then they spin. And the whirling dervishes are they're spinning. Oops. <laughs> You spin, and you spin, and you spin. And they're all spinning in a choreographed um, kind of a setup. And they're spinning for 30 seconds, and then for two minutes, and then for three minutes, and then for six minutes. At the 2018 uh, parliament, we saw a, a Sufi dancer. I don't know how long she spun, but it was so fast. And just went on and on and on and on. And she would just do these amazing uh, kind of features with her hands and her hair, and it was just wild. I mean, I don't know, maybe she went on for almost 10 minutes of just constant spinning. <laughs> you know, if I would spin like that, the ground would come up and meet me right at the side of my face at about the 22nd mark. So I ended up spending some time asking a, a question with one of the Sufis, and I said, how? <laughs> How did you do this? And she explained that after a while, it's like you're standing still, and all the colors blend together, and you enter a mystical state. And that is where you stay, in that mystical state. And you don't even know you're moving. It's just all blends, and all the lines converge and come together. It's the feeling of oneness. And then in the other corner, the, uh, the Sikh community in 2015 and in 2018 fed all of us, all of us, every day with a huge meal. And that was their way of participating in a practical sense at the parliament. A few other pictures. The lady on the top with a paintbrush is doing visionary artwork, uh, demonstrating how all religions come together, how we are all one by incorporating different symbols from different religions into this perennial, uh, perennial idea. On the bottom, we have Tibetan Buddhists doing a Buddhist sand mandala using colored sand and literally all week long pushing on like a narrow stick, almost like a, a straw, pushing little grains of colored sand to build a house. And it is a house for spirits. In Tibetan Buddhism, they do believe in angels and demonic beings and that you can encapsulate them. You can capture them and build a house for them. And then you take that house, that sand house, and you pour it into a river or some other body of water. Each day we had angels coming in. Um, it was just weird. I didn't know where they came from, but they would just show up and here come the angels walking in. Now, what you don't see in the picture is on the other side, there was a, a group of people walking in with black capes and black hoods. And we're like, this is just weird. It's like the angels and the devils coming together. Just bizarre. But I mean, this is a bizarre, bizarre place in many respects. And then the top picture. This was interesting because it demonstrated to us the seriousness of the spiritual reality that we are in. The, the Swami, the Guru, had stopped myself and my friends and he said, I want you to see something. And he had a daughter, one of the girls is his daughter and one of them is his daughter's friends and they're about 10 years old. And he says, watch this. And he put cotton balls on the girl's eyes and then he put a mask over their eyes so they could not raise their eyelids. And then he wrapped their heads two or three times with a scarf and you need to understand, we are in each other's space. They're not on a stage. They're not far away. We, are, we can touch each other. I can get down on my hands and knees and look up to see. Can they see through anywhere around their, around their blindfolds? No, no, they can't. And then the, the, the guru gave us cards and said, write anything you want on this card. So I wrote down John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the others all wrote something different. And then the guru put it in the hands of the girls. 
And then those girls, completely blind, would hold those cards out or put them up against their foreheads and then read them word perfect every time. It didn't matter what we wrote, but they would read it word perfect. At one point, the guru takes one of our cards, flips it upside down, puts it backwards in her hands. She can't read it. She says, there's something wrong. It must be upside down. Later on, we had a chance to talk to those two young girls. We just asked, how? How did you do this? And they said, after a year of intensive yoga training, intensive meditation, we have finally been able to open up all of our chakra and open up our third eye, our head chakra. And now we are seeing spiritually. And I asked the, the guru, the father, can you do this? He says, I can only see colors. He says, there's something about children that are more open and susceptible to, to having that spiritual awakening. And I'm just like, wow, we do live in a spiritual reality. It is around us. It is real. It is very, very real. A few other things from the parliament. The parliament had a red tent temple. And the red tent temple was the womb of the parliament. Is where, the, if you're a woman specifically, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, we're gender neutral, right? It's the, it's all blends together. But specifically, though, for, for women, I mean, there is a biological difference. For women, you could go and celebrate your divine flow, your sacred cycle, and you could go and engage in rituals and practices to celebrate your divine feminine. One of the hallways had, I counted 85, but I know there was more depictions of the goddess. And you see that on the top picture. And over and over again, we were told that the goddess is real and we are working on behalf of the goddess because she is the earth and you are her representative. So here's a few statements from the parliament just to give you a sense, a feeling or a taste of what was said there. Chief Paulette, Canadian, said this, what is sin? The greatest and the biggest sin that man can make is to abuse Mother Earth. Brian McLaren, the, you could say the father of the emergent church movement, made this statement. Listen carefully. I don't know which comes first. Do I love creation because I love the creator? Or do I love God because I can't help but love the fish and the trees and the birds and the mountains and the fresh air? I don't know which comes first. But I know that the two go inextricably together. Brothers and sisters, the earth is singing to us. The earth is crying to us. The earth is groaning to us. I'm sorry, that's oneism. You are now in the oneist camp. And there are, is really no distinction between this and what Chief Paulette said. And over and over again, that was the language. That was the message. A few other quick statements. I am you. This is on a workshop, by the way, on asking the question, are we really all one? This is a really important workshop. It was a room of about 300 people. And before I give you the statement, I'll give you the background. Room of about 300 people. Um, for about the first five minutes, the moderator led everybody in uh, meditation. So everybody shut down, did their breathing, went into their meditative state. And then he said, hey, what was your religious conversion like? Give me a word or a short sentence of your religious conversion. Your aha moment. So hands popped up. Joy, peace, harmony. On it went. These feelings, these, these, this, this language. And then the moderator stopped and said, that's the point. We're all representing different religions in this room. We have Buddhists and Hindus and Christians and Sikhs and the list goes on. And you're all saying the same thing. See, our experience of spirituality shows that we are all one. It's what you experience. I'm sorry, but I've been to Christian services. And this, I'm going to point the fingers at ourselves because we do this in our churches too. I've been to Christian services when after you walk out, people go, oh, I felt God moving. Really? Really? Was it God? Or was, did you get a, do, a, a shot of dopamine and adrenaline? A, a, adrenaline? What was it? What was it? Because I can take you to Burning Man. I can take you to a rave. I can take you to a pagan festival. I can take you to the Parliament of World Religions. 
And you can feel, and that's the point, you can feel the exact same thing. So we have to start asking ourselves the question, what is true biblical spirituality? Because it's not what we feel. It is grounded in what is true. And so this is what the moderator explained to us. He says, I am you. You are me. It is that level of unification and oneness that we want to address this morning because we thought it is the most fundamental level of unity, the most fundamental level of oneness. And it's not just to be found in reasoning or in dialogue. It's to be found in the direct experience of that reality within ourselves to see the divinity in other people. That is a wonderful thing. A couple other quick statements. We are one with all life. We are one with the one. And finally, let us stand. We stand as one people under the same tree of life to harmonize a profound sense of oneness and wonder with the urgency of our times. And it went on and on like that for a week. And I could leave you with statements all day long that reflect this basic idea. Now let me take you quickly to the latest one, which happened in 2018, November the 1st to the 7th. It took place in Toronto. And the theme, and I really want you to remember this theme, the theme was the promise of inclusion, the power of love. Does that make you feel good? Yes? Yes, keep that really fuzzy feeling right there. The promise of love, the power, pardon me, the promise of inclusion, the power of love. One of the statements made at, at the beginning of the parliament, may the promise of the oneness of humanity guide this parliament. And it was about oneness. So there's just an opening photo of, as the, as the crowds gather to hear the opening sessions and opening ceremonies. Um, moments, oh, I'm just going to give you also here, here, a quick list of names before I get into a few other pictures. We tend to think of this as just simply being a gathering of religious personalities and figures. No, no, there is a political reality in play. Some of these names, most of these names won't mean anything to you. But these are representatives from the United Nations, from other foreign policy groups. Um, we had uh, Christina Figures. She was the executive uh, secretary for the United Nations Framework for Climate Change, the one that gives us the Paris Climate Agreements. She was there. Uh, for anybody who's from Canada in this, in this room or watching online, Kim Campbell, our former prime minister, was there. We had senators, Canadian senators. We had people from all walks of the political spectrum. See, politics and religion do blend at this level. They really do. And there was a lot of discussions of things like climate change and nuclear, nuclear proliferation and what to do regarding world peace, that type of thing. Oh, by the way, the 2015 parliament, just to give you a sense of the pol political interplay, at the 2015 parliament, Karina Gore, Al Gore's daughter, she was there. Uh, Al Gore couldn't make it in person, so he sent a personal video to all of us. And then the parliament took Karina Gore, made her the ambassador of climate change, and sent her to the Paris climate talks to represent all the religions of the world to the Paris climate talks. Yes, politics and religion. So here's a few other images. Uh, before the opening ceremonies took place, we had indigenous leaders give us a, uh, light a sacred fire, and they kept that sacred fire going all week long, even though it rained most of the week in Toronto. But it was always a constant reminder that your, your spiritual guidance is really back to the earth. Uh, in the corner up on top here uh, is an interfaith discussion on how religions can come together at the institutional level and, uh, and engage in in peaceful coexistence. The lady on the end is a witch, and then a representative, a Hindu representative, another Sikh representative, he sits on the parliament board, and then we have two representatives, Christian representatives, from two other major interfaith organizations, one of them being the United Religions Initiative. One of the big questions that came up, and while I was at that, my cousin and my friends, who were also with me, were at another talk that was very similar in nature, and the question that popped up in both of our talks was, how do we engage the interfaith, how do we engage the evangelical community into interfaithism? Because we're the last holdout. We really are the last holdout. How do we, how do we have this, you know, bridge this divide? 
And so that was the big question. The panel that I was listening to didn't really have a firm answer. The panel that my cousin, my friends went to had a little bit more practical guidance about how you can now impact your local congregation. So one of the ideas was, look, don't go to the senior pastor. If you want to engage in interfaith work, start with a youth pastor or an associate pastor or the youth leaders. And don't introduce them to a multitude of other religions. Introduce them to their, to their counterpoint in one other religion, primarily Islam, because there seems to be in their mind a closer connection as a monotheistic faith. And then you allow them to engage in joint community service. You don't bring up theology. You don't bring up doctrinal issues. You bring up community service, social justice. And then from social justice and community service, then you deepen the relationship. And it doesn't take long. And you now have developed an inter-church, inter-mosque, inter-synagogue, inter-faith network in that community. And that was how they saw this being practically done. A couple of other quick pictures. Yes, we had a red tent temple. We did have the womb of the parliament at the 2018 event. Uh, all the people dancing, that happened every day. There was a cosmic peace dance, and it didn't matter what faith you were, you could join in and sing praises to the cosmos together. Uh, the table with all the different religious symbols, a lady wouldn't let me take her picture, but she was trying to demonstrate that we're engaged in universal religion. We're all, we're all uh, you're coming at the, to the table with our diverse practices and your diverse beliefs. But in diversity, we can find some unity, and the unity being here that we can all be one. A few other quick pictures. We had a pagan, um, a pagan booth set up uh, representing the sacredness of earth, lots and lots of yoga, all through the event, lots of yoga. Ayahuasca. Uh, ayahuasca was introduced to us uh, as a spiritual tradition that we now needed to embrace as a legitimate spiritual practice. Here's something very important about the Parliament. It legitimizes new spiritual movements. The 1993 Parliament, and the, again the 1999, it legitimized the pagan community. So much so that even at this event, there was talk about how important the Parliament was to legitimizing, in the eyes of the public, the pagan community. Because the Parliament was really the first public declaration that you have a spiritual tradition that we recognize as being valid and important as a contributor to global religion. Well, 2018, it was ayahuasca being introduced, which is a, it's a spiritual tradition, a shamanistic tradition based out of the Amazonia rainforest. And ayahuasca is, uh, right now, it, it's the thing to do if you are a Silicon Valley insider. If you are from San Francisco, you work for one of the major tech companies, the thing to do is to fly down to Brazil or to do it somewhere in the U.S. secretly. You go as a collective, as a group. A shaman will lead you through it. And then you infuse yourself with a tea. Ayahuasca is a tea compro comprised of two plant substances. And it unleash, uh, un unleashes the DMT molecule also known as a spirit molecule. And DMT will now all of a sudden open up a profound psychedelic experience where in certain instances, entities come to you and download information, new information. And then you walk away from that experience. And by the way, it's not always a pleasant experience. A lot of people will, will barf their guts out and uh, yeah, there's some pretty nasty side effects. But it's interesting, when I've been at Burning Man, there's a lot of talk of ayahuasca, and I mean a lot. As Silicon Valley insiders go to ayahuasca ceremonies for what they describe literally as their downloads of new information, as they now have a spiritual entity come to them imparting new knowledge through a psychedelic encounter. So this is introduced to the 2018 parliament as now a legitimate faith that we need to embrace as having a valid expression of spirituality. A couple of other three more quick, quick, quick pictures. Um, energy healing on the top, not touching the person, but somehow healing through your energy, like Reiki. Uh, yes, we had a labyrinth. Churches have labyrinths. 
Uh, welcome to the mystical age. And yes, we play the games, and to our shame and to our discredit. We had a Hindu temple set up at the parliament with those same girls. But now they had taken it one step up. I have lip balm in my pocket. You would go to those girls, and they would say, take out whatever's in your pocket, ladies, whatever's in your purse, whatever has small print. And then they'd be fully blindfolded. And then they would read the small print, tell you what this is, and then read the small print. Wow. Remember the theme, the promise of inclusion, the power of love. Repeatedly, from the opening ceremonies to the closing, we were told there was no longer any room for religious truth claims. It is time to end separating faiths. What's also very important about the Parliament, and you need to have this in your head, the Parliament sets the tone for the liberal left religious community. This sets the tone. And so what happens at the Parliament filters down, down, down into the religious community around us. We were told exclusive truths are taboo, and definitely, all throughout it, even though it wasn't said explicitly, it was definitely implied, the uniqueness of Jesus Christ is divisive. The other side of this was, if you're a patriot to your country, and this was emphasized strongly, you are a nationalist. And nationalism is one of the greatest threats that we are facing. It's an evil scourge. Free market capitalism, we were told, over and over again is evil. Free market capitalism. And yet, I was sitting there, and my, I got two other friends, Brian and Audrey, who are with me, and they might even be watching right now. They're from Alberta. And we heard over and over again how evil capitalism is. <laughs> We're like, how did you get here? Where did you get the shoes you're wearing? The clothes you're wearing? The car you drove up? The building that we're in? Really? Isn't that convenient? We will use all of the benefits of free market capitalism as we preach socialism and the end of free market capitalism. But the big thing, the scary thing, was the new language, the new phraseology. We're no longer fundamentalists. We're no longer extremists. Both of those you can live with to some extent. I have no problem saying I'm a fundamentalist. Fundamentalist in the work of Jesus Christ, his truths, you bet. We're all on that side. Extremists, I don't like that language. I don't think that's a healthy, a healthy word to use. But at the same time, okay, all right, I, I see where that's coming from. And I can argue with you on that. But the language, the new language was this. You are a supremacist. You are a supremacist. You are a religious supremacist. You are a national supremacist. You were to, we were told over and over again, if you are a national supremacist and a religious supremacist, you are a white supremacist. And it didn't even matter what the color of your skin is. Truly, it didn't matter. We were told that because it wasn't about your skin color. It was about an ideology. hi yi yi Jim Wallace from Sojourners opened up the parliament. He represents the liberal side of Christianity. And this was taking place right at the time of the U.S. midterm elections. And so he described the U.S. midterm elections in this respect, that the midterm elections is really a battle between angels and demons. And those who supported Trump, you're supporting the worst of the demons. It was so bad. It was so bad that there was times when we talked to some of the volunteers later on during the course of the week. So what do you think of Jim Wallace's talk? And they're like, I wasn't comfortable with it. Even the left was uncomfortable with some of the rhetoric that was coming out. It was crazy to watch. And then there's this, just to demonstrate the power of love and inclusion. Remember, that's our theme all week long. You're a nationalist, you're a supremacist. You're an evangelical Christian, you hold to the belief in Jesus Christ, you're a supremacist. And all week long, we had that grilled into our head. And then this. So what is this? This is an art piece that was being done over the course of the week. She is a Baptist minister. Put this together, please. She is a Baptist minister engaging in a Buddhist San Mandela art technique 
over the course of the week, constructing Kali, the Hindu deity of death and destruction. And in Kali's hand is a severed head of Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh with the severed heads of those who confirmed Kavanaugh around Kali's waist. And then at the end of the week, I have it on video, I was there watching, they did an, a dance invocation to Kali, ending with peace and namaste and shalom, and then they destroyed the Mandela and a symbolic act of destroying Kavanaugh and all that he stands for. Hey, if we did that in this room, and shame on us if we would ever go to this level, but if we did that in this room, pointing to, let's say, Barack Obama, uh, Barack Obama during his administration, we would be absolutely vilified in the media. But they're the ones that set the narrative. So what was being offered? We're gonna to get to the end of this pretty quick. We we're offered a path of salvation. A few things you need to understand. The interfaith agenda aligns itself with the power of the United Nations, the transforming power of the United Nations. A lot of talk of sustainable development and the development, Millennium Development Goals. We need global governance. That was being expressed all the way through the event. We're global citizens with fidelity to our mother. We need to have a vision for the international community and the parliament brings a moral, spiritual vision to the international community. We were told that we have to engage in global revolution and that we even need to be subversive as we push forward this agenda because it is a revolution of mind. Four quick quotes taken from my notes. Embrace oneness or we will be forced to do so. The Archbishop from Chicago, Catholic Archbishop said this, what we have coming about is, a one, is one world with a common plan. One of the Swamis said this, we the peoples of the world need to unite and demand a world government and a world parliament based on an earth constitution. Canadian said, Senator Douglas Roche said, we have to resist those who would be against us. And he is referring very specifically to those of us who would be considered supremacists. All of this is couched in salvation. The closing statements from the executive director of the parliament was this, thanks to all of those who are committed to the salvation of the earth. And he re-emphasized again, he re-emphasized that as we save the earth, we save ourselves. This is not conspiracy. This is not conspiracy theory. It is an alternative redemption story. I made that mention yesterday and I want that in your head. This is an alternative salvation message. That's what the world is offering. So how do we address it? Well, I have friends who attend with me. We go to the parliament and we're there doing research. Here's a few of my friends. There's Ryan and Audrey and Don Vineau from Midwest Christian Outreach, Bill Hansberger on the top. That's from the 2015 parliament on the top as well. We're there. We're attending the workshops, we're listening, we're trying to gauge what's happening in the interfaith movement. And then every 10 to 15 feet, you can stop and talk to somebody of a different faith and a different worldview. And these guys are doing it. We're there, we're actually engaging, we're having discussions with people of other religions. I had a really interesting discussion with a guy that a name tag that said Reverend. And I said, what are you Reverend of? Uh, he, he's a Wiccan high priest. And so we ended up having like a 45 minute really good discussion of oneism versus twoism. Beautiful place to begin. And so we were there doing literally guerrilla evangelism. We paid our dues, we got in the door, we're there for research, and we're there for outreach. Why are we afraid? Truly, why are we afraid? Listen, the fear of man will paralyze us. The fear of God frees us. And all these people, every one of them, and the powers and principalities behind them, they will all bend their knee to the one we bend to already in love. And they will be bending in judgment. So why are you afraid, really? And yes, we're in a not that much different situation. It's 2008, a Pew survey that was done showing that roughly 52% of American Christians think that at least some non-Christian faiths can lead to eternal life. 
And in the Pew Research Survey, it was, it was uh, stated very categorically, this is not another denomination, this is another faith. So this is 2008, I would suggest it's probably higher now. Welcome to the world. Welcome to your new age. A few quick problems of interfaithism, and then we'll close. Because there are problems, and you need to have this in your mind as to why we no longer, why we don't participate. It undermines the truth of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is nothing more than another religious teacher or reformer in the interfaith movement. If all religions are equally valid expressions of truth, none of them are. And the secular world can say, see, it's all a meaningless mound of religious gobbledygook. We undercut the biblical Great Commission. We work for social justice and peace, and we downplay the core biblical truths. We entrench the status quo. We don't challenge their worldview. We don't challenge ours. It's all happy kumbaya as we zipper our lips. And it sows confusion in the church. A lot of confusion in the church. I could tell you a lot of stories of that. Is Jesus Christ the only way? Yes. You are his legal official representatives of the one who is the only way. This is our calling in an interfaith world. I encourage you, I challenge you to stand strong in the faith and look for those opportunities to present the way, the truth, and the life. Even as the world around us, and even maybe even as your own churches, embrace in the interfaith agenda. Tim, I'll turn it back to you.